Hello, I'm Airman Belair. I am a C5 load and I joined the Air Force because I love to travel. I've been in the Air Force for about a year. Talked to the recruiter in September of 2018. I signed my contract in October and then I shipped out in November of 2018. So I went through BMT for Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's. So if you have any questions about that, happy to answer <laughs> whatever you have. Um, my current rank, I signed as a is an A1C and I was told that I'm ready to, to rank up. So I'm just waiting to sew on uh, E4. The name of my job, so the official name of my job is a loadmaster, so I'm a C5 load and the one, uh, the AFSC is 1 alpha 2. Um, anything that's 1 alpha is air crew, so the 2 identifies the loads. I got my job when I signed my contract, so I'm, I'm in the reserves. I'm not active duty, I'm under active orders right now. So when I talked to my recruiter, they, I first went through MEPS, I tested well on the ASVAB, and then I went through and did my uh, mes my medical and I passed the air crew uh, physical. And then the recruiter hooks you up with an interview and you have to be interviewed by the local squadron. And it's a typical job interview. Went pretty well and as long as you actually make it through the training, you're, uh, you're in. So with the contract, my contract was just for a load. So if something happened and I washed out um, or something happened during training that I couldn't actually do the job, the Air Force would not reclass me. That was like my my safe my safety net. So if you go as a reserve or in the guard, your contract is just for the job that you signed for. It's a little bit a little bit different than active duty. Definitely. Yes. I sought out a traveling job. I sought out a job that I that I would be actually using my, my brain. <laughs> I used to be a teacher. And so I'm looking to uh, change careers, and I, I, I enjoy puzzles and I enjoy math, so right now it's a, it's a great job. Any other job that I wanted? Nope, this was it. <laughs> this was the job I was looking for, and, um, and I haven't regretted it since. If I was in another life, maybe I would maybe consider like seer instructor. You get to camp out and live off the land, and that, I mean, that seems pretty cool, but Right now I'm happy. Happy with either staying on base or staying in hotels and, and flying around. <laughs> I signed a six year contract, so like I said, I'm changing careers, so I actually look to do this a little bit more long term. But I, the door is open that if I want, I could still fly and go to college full time or continue another job during the week and then still fly, you know, once or twice a month in the future. So that. The, the nice thing about the reserves is you have that, that opportunity to have different options while you're still, um, while you're still serving, so. Tech school is actually pretty long. I guess it's, in a nutshell, six months, technically, but after the six months, you come back to your base and you have what's called a prog tour. So it's six months plus nine months of a prog tour. I'll explain. So in general, so I'm on active duty orders right now for technically a year and a half. We went to Lackland, Kelly, and Fairchild before going back to my home base. So right after BMT, you basically transfer to the other side of, this, of the base. And that's where you have aircrew fundamentals. Any enlisted that is aircrew has to take a fundies class, and that's about a week and a half long. That class is, I mean, I was in the class with linguists and uh, sensor operators. Um, and other loads, so it was a variety of aircrew. And then at the end of that class, the linguists learn what language they have, what language they're assigned. And the second part of that class is you actually go through chamber, so your body experiences hypoxia. And so that's pretty cool because that's the first time you actually put on, put on the equipment. So that was at Lackland, and then right after that class, so all aircrew go through that, and then, and then all the loads go through, it's called BLM, and that's Basic Loadmaster. Uh, there's a basic loadmaster course. And so all the loads take a five-week course. And then a few weeks into that course, if you're active duty, that's when you find out what airframe you're assigned to. I already knew because I signed my contract for a C5. So it depends on depends on, on the week. Some weeks they, they, they tend to give more C130s and some weeks they tend to give more C17s. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but 
that's when they get it. And then at the end of that course, at the end of the five weeks from BLM, that's when you earn your wings. So I didn't realize I would get my wings so, so quickly, so fast. Um, so that was a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool uh, graduation from that tech school. And then from graduating from uh, BLM, then we went and transferred from another side of, to the other side of the base, closer to Kelly. And so you actually reside in Lackland, but the classroom is in Kelly. So they give you a vehicle to drive around base and um, that's called IQT. So that's initial um, qualification training and that's only for C5s. So you have air crew and then you have load masters and then you have C5 specific. And then this is 10 week course, IQT. And, if, and during that course is when you learn the actual numbers and uh, everything for the C5 specific. And you actually get your hands on the ramp and door trainer. You actually get to kneel the, the aircraft. You get to open up, open up uh, the, uh, the the forward and aft doors. You get to actually run the panel, the flight engineer panel. So it's a lot, a lot of hands on, but it's also a lot of CBTs. So it was uh, a lot of, uh, and then also you're running, you're doing time in the sim. So you're in the simulator, and then following that 10 week course, then you have what's called a 15 day course. So it's not kind of part of it, but they don't really say it's mandatory. So I had budget funding issues, so I only got a five-day course, but technically during the 15-day course of IQT, you have 15 days of flying twice a week and then extra time and practice on the ramp door trainer and actually working with the, the active, the, the reservist down there, which is pretty neat. They're, they're really nice. Following IQT, then you go to SEER. Uh, that was the order I went in. Then I went to SEER up in Fairchild, and Fairchild had SEER as well as water survival. SEER is the survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. That was intense. Um, parts of that was awesome. Other parts was horrible, but can't talk about that. The difference between SEER and any other training was that was the one time that you went through tech school and you didn't have any weekends off. So all the other tech schools, you went from Monday to Friday and then you had Saturday and Sunday. You could do your own thing. Seer, once you start, it's from beginning all the way to the end, no days in between is a break. And so they purposely set it up so they control how much you sleep and how much you're working and how much you're in class. So they have it down to a science. They know what they're doing. I'm glad I went through it. I don't want to do it again, <laughs> but, um, but I'd rather do the training and not need it than not have the training and, and need it. So, uh, so Seer was three weeks and then I did water survival. And that was only for three days. You could do a two-day course or a three-day course. They put me in for the parachuting course. I loved it. It was like a, it's like a million-dollar water park for a few days. They did. It's awesome. Lots of hands-on. People asked if they could fail just so they could take the class again. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna do well if you go, because they just make it so hands-on and so realistic. It's, it's definitely, out of, all the, out of all the training, that was definitely the most fun, most enjoyable. After seer and water survival, then I was told to go home and then I was told to take 11 days off. So I started my prog tour the end of August, beginning of September, and then I go all the way up until the middle to end of May. So, so in a nutshell, it's about a year and a half of training. The actual days, it's for the, strictly speaking, your tech school is six months, not including the prog tour. Um, but keep in mind, if you're active duty, when you're sitting at tech school, you are not a priority. You a lot of times sit two weeks to one or two months in between classes. Because I'm a reservist, um, I'm not. I'm only on active orders for as long as I'm there, and so they wanted to get me in and out, in and out, in and out. So my my tech school was one after the other, whereas other people that went through schooling the same time as I did that were active duty, some of them are still sitting around and they're not even doing missions yet. Well, I've already been out on several missions, so that's one of the perks of, of being in the reserves. So as a C5, like I said, there are other loads. You have C-17s and C-130s, but for C5s, there are only two active bases. Um, Travis and Dover, so one coast or the other, and then two reserve bases, Kelly and Westover. There are reservists at Travis and Dover. That's the way it is. So from what I understand, Dover travels east and Travis travels west, and then the reservists get to pick going east and west or west. So I like to think that we get the best of the two, but... A load supervises the loading and unloading of cargo, vehicles, and people. 
So anything that goes on the plane uh, that needs to be transported somewhere else, we basically direct and make sure that it needs to go in this certain location so that the placement and weight distribution is evenly set up so that basically if you take the plane and you dangle it on a string, the weight on the plane is going to keep the plane level so that when they want to fly, when the pilot wants to go up, basically they'll be able to. We make sure that everything is restrained. Uh, everything is strapped down, everything has the proper restraints so that it doesn't shift in flight. We work, I don't know, a couple hours before the flight and then a couple hours depending on the load. We load up, we oversee the loading, the loading, we oversee the unloading, and then while we're on the ground, we're basically um, civilians until, until it's time to load up again. It's a fun job. We definitely get to travel and um, you get to sightsee in the locations that you're at. In some places, you just basically you only have time to load and unload, and then you're gone. So sometimes you get to see the local local spots, and other times you don't. Uh, right now, I'm a student, so I'm Monday through Friday, so eight something in the morning until three in the afternoon. That includes they give you time to go to the gym, so it's really not a heavy heavy load. And then once I'm qualified. Basically, I just need to keep up with my qualifications and then, um, then, then go on missions every every month or so. I was told some people do load planning, load planning for major companies. They do it um, in the United States as well as uh, downrange. Uh, it's not, I guess, not a huge thing, but I have heard of people doing it. Um, most places, uh, most people I know are, uh, they work locally. Either they have their own company or, um, or they just work like police officer, fireman, or just at the local jobs. Me being a reservist, a lot of, there's a number of active, I guess, active reservists who have EGR slots or, or positions. But so there are people that are there on base all the time, as well as instructors that fly with me. And sometimes there's instructors that just come just for when I, when I fly, so. We don't deploy. <laughs> C5s don't deploy because, uh, well, we do TDYs. We go on missions and our missions can be anywhere from, I guess, three days to whatever they need. Usually not in any location for more than a couple weeks, but I guess it depends if we break down. But yeah, so we don't go to deployment locations. We can drop off at those locations, but... For C5s, I guess my main advice is you can't be afraid of heights. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big plane. Um, if you don't know from, I guess, ground to tail, it's about six and a half stories tall. So it's, um, it's pretty big. And uh, inside the actual cargo area, you can actually transport six commercial Greyhound buses. So that, that's like, that's just cargo and that's not counting the troop compartment, which you can put um, people up above as well. So you have to not be afraid of heights, enjoy puzzles, enjoy math, it definitely helps. You have to have good people skills because you also deal with any space A travelers. You always have something in your ears when you're traveling. Either these things that go in and then you also have your headset. Some people call them vice grips. <laughs> but if you, don't like, if you don't like wearing something on your head, it probably isn't a good job for you because you constantly, especially when you're, when you're flying and you have to be talking with the front or talking with the, uh, with the scanner, you need to keep communication, um, so you do need to have something in your head all the time, either in your ears or above. For I would say most of the time, and even in flight, you also need to have that, that communication. So it's one of those things I didn't know, but now I do. <laughs> one of the perks uh, right now is we're wearing what's called the, the green pajama. Green pajamas. It's the old, the old flight suit. Some of the, some of the other bases are wearing the, the two-piece OCPs. I don't know. I don't know what the Air Force is going to do as far as deciding that down down the road. But right now, right now we're 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 just being issued the green flight suits and then the uh, and the tan flight suits for downrange. So of the of the Air Force, only two percent of the Air Force actually flies, and then of that two percent, two percent are females. So I guess there's not that many of us, but we're around. <laughs> you still have the same PT requirements, the same physical requirements for air crew. So you just if you keep up, you're good. And then of the for once, not just when you're in training, but also throughout your career, you have to keep up with your testing. So it's not like once you're in, you're in. You also have to test throughout. And not many people know, but a passing grade is an 85. Anything below an 85 is a fail. So if you get an 84, it's a no-go. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're not good at memorizing, or you're not good at math, or you're just not good at test taking, there's less wiggle room to, um, to actually, 
actually get by. For in-flight duties, there are three different positions on a C5 that a loadmaster can have. They can be either aft flight deck, cargo, or troop compartment. So if you're a troop compartment, you're basically seeing, watching the loading and unloading of the passengers, and then you stay with them throughout the flight. You don't cook for them. Uh, you, you basically, if they purchase box lunches, you pass those out. Otherwise, most people just bring their own food. And you're basically, you're the one who's in charge of their well-being, making sure they're, 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 they're comfortable. Uh, blankets, pillows, temperature. Of course, anything goes wrong. Um, you're there to help out with any emergency equipment. If you're cargo, that means you are the one who's supervising the loading and unloading of, uh, of, the, of the pallets or of the rolling stock or of whatever whatever comes into the cargo compartment. So you're going to be you're going to be directing the K loader. You're going to be directing, directing the forklift. You're going to be saying where everything is going to be positioned on the plane. And we can take quite a few. We can take up to 36 pallets on the C5, or we can take uh, two Abram tanks. Um, six Apache uh, helicopters, or we could take 15 Humvees. So, uh, fun fact: we can also, if you take the wings off the C-130, you can take that the whole, um, the entire uh, cargo of the of the C-130, you can fit it inside of the C-5. So it's like an anaconda eating another plane. <laughs> so that's uh, the car, and then cargo actually doesn't sit. No one's allowed to sit in the cargo area during flight. So cargo sits in troop with whoever's on troop. And then if you're aft flight, if you're aft flight deck. Uh, your job is to, once again, the pre-flights, everybody has pre-flights of their, of their section of the plane, but then you also are in charge of the Form F, um, you're in charge of any, any paperwork before, uh, before takeoff, and then also before you land into uh, other countries, you're also in charge of the, um, the customs page, custom paperwork, as well as any, any forms that you need for your base for, for in-flight, um, for where you've landed, what time you landed, um, and all that, all those details, and basically know your work follow the instructors, and um, you know, have a good career. Uh, if anybody has any extra questions, or if you want to, I guess, see, see what I'm up to, I, I can't give recent posts, but I do keep up with Instagram once in a while. I do have an Instagram account, um, CAB3CA, so Charlie Alpha Bravo Tree, Charlie Alpha. Uh, it is a private account, but if you ask to follow, um, I'll let you in, and I will, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and, uh, and send them to me.